we're accountable for the words that we speak. And these are the verses I read. Let me just read them to you. It's verse 33 through 37 of Matthew chapter 12. And it says this, a tree is defined by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. Then Jesus says this, you brood of snakes. Oh, man. People say, well, God is love and he's so kind and stuff. A brood of snakes sounds kind of rough, doesn't it? You know, he, he's, he can be in your face, which is okay. I need that. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of his heart, and an evil person produces evil from the treasury of his heart. And then verse 36. I tell you this, we must give account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Your words will either acquit you or condemn you. People, we got to give account for every word. And how many of you know words can be great and words can be evil? I mean, we can build a building with bricks, but how about, you can throw them through a window too. And water's great, it quenches thirst, but it can flood you out. And so we're accountable for our words. And the key point here being changing our environment changes our world. And we're talking about Esther, and the idea behind Esther is Xerxes was the king, and he had a, a bride named Vashti. She was the queen, and he was on a drunken binge for seven days and then came out and said, I want my wife to come out and show off how beautiful she is. She said no, and he kicked her out of the kingdom. And then the Bible said when he got sober, he regretted doing that. And so words came out of his mouth. He regretted them, but he couldn't bring it back there. And the environment, what we say is when you change your environment, you change your world. What does that mean? A, a study, let me read you something here about a study that came out. And this is what it said. People that were treated rudely by other people were 30% less creative than others in this study, and they produced 25% less great ideas. What does that mean? What they did is they grabbed people and put them in two different rooms, and they gave each one of them a brick. And the first group that they treated badly, they didn't just like, you're idiots, you can't do anything. That's not what they did for the study. They gave them the brick, but they created an environment of non-creativity. They said, it's just a brick. We don't know what you can do with a brick, but it's a brick. Come up with some ideas of what you would do with this brick. Let's face it, it's just a brick. And you know what the people came up with? Well, I guess we could build a school or a wall. Or, and you can do that with a brick, but how many know that's not creative? The second group, they went in and created an atmosphere, and they literally came up and said, you guys are so creative. This is a brick, and we know it's just a brick, but can you guys come up with something original to do with this brick? Because you guys are so creative. We want to do something with this brick. Those people didn't come up with building a school or anything. They came up with, let's sell it on eBay and get a whole bunch of bricks and then sell them, and soon we'll have a lot of bricks. Some of them said, let's decorate them and sell them. And some people came up with the creativity of making it into abstract art that we can hang in a museum. How many realize the difference of the atmosphere there? Some people had incredible creativity and some did not at all. Okay? And so what I'm sharing with you today is the atmosphere around us, people, can build up or destroy faith. Just like it did creativity, it can build or destroy faith. And again, I'm not talking about this living mass in the universe that we create an environment around us by speaking and the environment, you know, attraction, the law of attraction. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't think that the universe is alive as such. Jesus Christ is alive, and we line up with what he says about us. And that's what I'm challenging us to do today. Because a bad environment can just destroy faith in our lives. Uh, let me step back just for a moment. Exerces made a decision about his wife when he was on a seven-day drunken binge. How can he, many can imagine that after drinking for seven days, you probably don't have a lot of wisdom and make life-changing decisions? And he asked his advisors to come up with life-changing decisions. These guys have been drinking for seven days, and they have 173 days of drinking ahead of them. It's probably not a great time to come up and say, yeah, let's just, like, do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the environment around us 
can create things. And so a bad environment, what do I mean by a bad environment? And this happens in the church. I'm talking to us as a church today. I can sit there and look at my car and complain about my car. My car is a hunk of junk. It's lousy. It's always breaking down. I hate the thing. And that creates an environment of how I'm looking at my car. And when I'm looking at my car in that way, how many know every time something bad happens, it just reinforces what I'm already thinking about the car? I can do it with my family. Oh, my kids, they're lousy. They're not accomplishing it. They're really a disappointment. And then anything that they do it adds to that disappointment feeling. You literally create an environment of how we see that. And that's why the Bible said in Matthew chapter 12, a bad heart is going to produce bad fruit. It's just a natural thing. And that's the way we are. And the Bible says those kind of words we're going to have to give an account for. But if I begin to look at things with a different attitude, now I'm not saying my car that's breaking down, if I speak over it, it'll never break down again, but it changes the attitude of how I deal with these problems when they come up in my life. Okay, if I keep speaking over my car, it doesn't mean it's never going to blow a tire. But when I do that, I'm not living in an environment, oh, of course, all these things always happen to me. How many know these kind of lines come out of our mouth? Everything bad always happens to me. Why doesn't anything ever go my way? And that's creating an environment where we just expect things to go wrong in our lives and we're not lining up. And this type of environment was created with the Xerxes and Vashti and he booted her out of the kingdom. She lost, you're no longer queen. And what happened when he wasn't drunk anymore? He regretted it. Man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Not only did he regret it, it raised up an advisor, Haman. It raised him up, and he's going to become an antagonist and almost destroy every single Jew in the kingdom. How many know that that's a bad time to come up with decisions, and it created domino effect that just kept going on? So the key thing, how do you deal with a toxic environment? That's what I want to share, just a couple Bible verses in our lives. And the first one we know, it's in Matthew, or Romans chapter 12, about how we change our environment. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we know these verses. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifice, the kind that will be acceptable. This is the true way to worship God. So that's what, the goal of my life. I want my life to be a living and holy sacrifice to God because it said this is what makes me acceptable before God. How many want to be acceptable before God? Nine of us. All right, well, I'm going to speak to you nine and believe the rest of us are going to catch up. If you want to be acceptable, we got to make our lives a living, holy sacrifice. we got to present them to God. God, here it is. Then it says how you do that. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now we're just talking about how we think and how we talk. That's the behavior and custom of this world because people can always find a problem. Okay, I remember being at, this is showing my age. We went to Disney a couple years ago, and my girls took off and were riding rides. My wife and I went to the Walt Disney Museum in the middle of the park. How many know you don't go to walk through a museum? My wife and I did. It was amazing. If you ever go with your family, take your kids through that. They'll hate it, but you'll learn so much. And we're watching some of the inventions that he did, but there was one line he said there. He made his first full-length uh, animated movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And it said about how he was coming up and raising money to do that and put it all together. And then people complained before they presented it. And they complained, I don't like the way you did this. I don't like the way you did that. And he came up with this incredible line. It's become part of my life and I share quite a bit now. He said, I know it's not the best, but if you don't have an improvement, shut up. Isn't that incredible? I know it's a problem, but if you don't have a way to help that problem, shut up. So I'm, I would never say that to you, but Walt Disney is. Okay, and you can't go bad quoting Walt Disney, you know. 
What he's sitting here saying, don't copy the behavior. How many know people can always find a problem with everything and we create an environment where we expect everything to fall down? We don't like the way our boss runs things. We don't like the way the government treats our roads. The government's bad here, the government's bad there, everybody's bad, everybody's doing something wrong. I was downtown walking, uh, talking with a, a, just a guy that owns a store and I was just talking with him. I said, man, so many changes have happened the last seven, eight years with the Convergence Project and everything. What have you seen happening here? He goes, oh, it's incredible. And we were just talking back and forth. He said, but it's amazing how many people come in because whenever you do something, the cave people show up. I go, the cave people? I'm trying to think, where are caves in Eau Claire that the cave people show up? I, it's a part of Eau Claire I haven't witnessed yet. And he said, no, cave people are citizens against virtually everything. He said, whenever something comes up, he said, the cave people show up, and we're going to do this. Ah, I've never in all my days. And I thought of that, and then I went downtown. I go downtown and talk to people quite a bit. I was talking to this man. I said, man, they're doing some construction, fixing the bridge. No, nah, they don't need to fix that bridge. It's been fine for everything. And I went, Are you a cave person? I didn't ask him that. <laughs> no, I hear they're trying to put a new park in. That's not what Eau Claire needs is more parks. We didn't have a good day. I got a wristband for you. I want to pray. I, it, renew people. The copy behaviors and customs of this world, and it comes into the church. But let God, not you transform. Who's the only one that can transform us? Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. How do you become a new person? Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. How do you become a new person? By changing the way you, okay? But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Why can I do that? Look at this. This verse, chapter 12, verse 2 starts, and so, why would that, what interesting way to start a sentence, and so. It must be referring to what's in front of it. Look what it says in front of it. Who can know the Lord's thoughts? And who has enough, knows enough to give him advice? Man, don't we do that? How many like to try and advise God through our prayer? God, man, if I were you, this is what I would do in the valley. And God goes, ha, ha. This is what I would do in my life. This is what I would do here. We're always trying to advise God. And who has given him so much that he needs to take it back? And look at this. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. Everything comes from him. Everything exists because of his power. And everything is just for his glory. All glory to him forever and ever. And so, because everything comes from him, everything exists by his power, and everything is to glorify him, because of that, start to think like God thinks. Start to change your attitude. Start to change the environment around about us. Now, the military has a word for this. It's called cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring. They force the military to think differently when a situation comes bad. That I'm looking at this bad situation. Now i got to cognitively restructure it into something good. That i got to look at this and start to think, what are opportunities that can come from this? Because they said, in this, if you don't cognitively restructure and a bad, a bad thing happens in the middle of battle, you begin to think, I'm dead. I'm going to die. So they literally say, okay, this happened. How do we turn that around into an opportunity to get out of this situation? Does that make sense? Cognitive restructuring. Can you imagine what that would look like in the church? I go to Dunkin' Donuts, and the sprinkled donut is gone. I need my sprinkled donut. (laughs) Somebody knows sprinkles are for winners. I don't need a lawn, John. I need a sprinkled donut because it's got the hole in. And how many know the hole means less donut so you can eat more? (laughs) So I'm sitting there, and the sprinkled donut's not there. There's two ways to look at that. 
I'm never coming to Dunkin' Donuts again. Festival from now on. You were created a whole business mindset for donuts, and you don't have my donut. Or I could cognitively restructure and say, that's 15 minutes less on the treadmill. How many know just a little flip like that? You're planning on doing something outside, and it's rainy. Well, now I can stay inside and do something. Cognitive restructure. But you know what happens in the church? Oh, I can't believe it's raining. It's always raining when I want to do something. You know what? If God never let it rain when you wanted to do something, how many know the world would be destroyed by drought? <laughs> because there's always somebody doing something. And we're always praying, God, not today. Don't let it rain today. Don't let it rain today. It won't rain for the next five years. Just not today. Cognitively restructuring. Car breaks down. We were, this happened. Uh, I was with Pastor Carl, and we were driving, and he blew a tire, and we're on the side of the interstate with the blowing tire. Man, those trucks make a wind when they go by you. And we're trying to change it. Fortunately, the policeman came over. Now, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to help change a tire. It was hard. Carl did 98% of it. I stood there looking, yeah, that's a tire. <laughs> Flipping it on. I, I even put it on, and he said, it's backwards, Kim. 50% <laughs> chance, boom, we're on. Policemen stopped by. Two preachers on the side of the road with the policemen. We're done. I said, hey, thanks for stopping traffic. Could we pray with you? He goes, wow, that would be awesome. He said, you know what? Lately, there's so much fear in us that we just want to come home safe. He said, my wife's struggling with that. Wow. Cognitive restructuring that we got to do that. Now, I'm not saying God gave us a flat tire, but I'm saying when we're looking for opportunity, there's just always something. This happened in the Bible. There's people that did this. Look at David said in Psalm 27, 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would lose heart, people, unless we believe that God's going to move. Where? Now, we all know in heaven, but where does David say? I would lose heart. People, I think the church is losing heart. Oh, everything's going on. I can't believe it. We would have lost heart unless we believe that we're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. How many know that's cognitive restructuring? God, we would have been destroyed unless we believe that you are going to move in the land of the living. People, this is what God's asking. This is God's will for our lives. Uh, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He went through a 20-year journey, a 20-year journey of being a slave, of ending up in jail, of being elevated to the second most important person in Egypt and having his brothers stand in front of him begging for food. And you know what he did when he was sitting there in front of his brothers? He had the ability to kill them and destroy them. And you know what he said? He said, I believe that God has sent me here ahead of you to save your lives. Talk about looking at things through a different view. Cognitive restructuring. Look what Paul says. A way of renewing the mind. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It doesn't say, thank God for everything. What does it say? Thank God in everything. Not for everything, in everything. My wife and I drove up to a relative of hers funeral yesterday. He was a minister that got sick and passed away. And I tell you, one of the most awesome things is the family singing a worship song to God be the glory. And hundreds of people stand up all over. They've lost their pastor. They've lost their family member. They've lost their friend. Holding up hands, worshiping God. How many realize people, death is Satan's best weapon. It's the last weapon he can use. He did it. And he can do no more. And still people in everything are worshiping God. It's like Satan, you hit us with your best shot but you are God. And God says, you want to know my will? Do you want to know my will for your life? Let me transform your mind so you change the way you think. 
And when you worship me in every situation, this is my will. I talk to so many young people, and they're like, I don't know what God has for my life. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Can I challenge you? Let's obey what we know God is asking us to do, and then he'll give you the next step. What's God asking us to do? In every situation, you are my God. Changing our environment. How important is this? The Bible says if we don't change our environment, we have to give account before him someday. People, I want an environment of faith. Uh, this was laid heavily on my heart just two weeks ago. God just reminded me of something long ago. He said, Kim, I'm a supernatural church. Believe me for supernatural things on any given Sunday. So what do we have this morning? We have a guest singer sitting there stops and begins to prophesy over you. People, we're a supernatural people. We should expect supernatural things. You may sit there and go, well, that was unique and strange. Let's believe for supernatural things because he's a supernatural God. Let's change the environment. Go ahead, go ahead. So I look back at my life and I'm there. Wow, what do I do? This is, this is a little proverb I found. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. I wish I would have done this 20 years ago. So do I. But I can start one today. Change the way we think, God. Forgive me for complaining and griping and saying that, God, begin to worship in the middle of every situation. God, that you are the only one that can do it. Your power, your glory, your greatness. Pastor Kyle just prayed just a few minutes ago for those that we have in our family that aren't living for God. I begin to worship God, God, because you can do anything. I, I can look at where they're running or I can look at my God, change my point of view. People, what would happen in our life if we begin to change our environment? Let's quit making decisions after a seven-day drunken binge. No, I'm not saying you were out drinking for seven days. But let's quit making decisions after seven days of complaining instead of seven days of sitting in God's presence, worshiping Him and saying, you are my God. And let's believe what God can do in and through our lives. The key point here being changing our environment changes our world. Now, next week, there's a second part of this. What happens if your environment doesn't change in battle? There's still a solution in that. But right now, let's just pray. God, thank you that you are a great God. God, forgive us for complaining and whining. We're just like everybody else around us. God, I'm asking, change our hearts. Change our hearts. Forgive us, Father. Would you stand with me just for a moment? We're going to pray this. I, I'll, I'll come back and give you a blessing in just a moment. But we're going to pray into this. The Bible said, let God transform you. Let's pray to him. God, transform my thought life. Transform my thought life. I'm speaking bad over my spouse. I'm speaking bad over